Hello again, everyone. Um, this evening, I am talking to Chris Hammer, who is the author of Treasure and Dirt, as well as other books, as well you all know. Um, so I'm not going to waffle on too much about him because I'm going to talk directly to him. So um, sit back and enjoy. Chris, hello. It is lovely to have you. Hi, Kylie. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, author of four crime novels in four years, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. I think Scrublands was 2018. Then you follow that with Silver, follow that with Trust, and ah, da 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 da, Treasure and Dare. So, how does it feel? It feels pretty good, actually. I'm, people say that, and it's it kind of feels a bit surprising even to me that I've managed to do four in four years. Mind you, Scrublands, the first one, didn't take me a year to write. It took me a lot longer than that. So, but these aren't your first books because Scrublands, if I'm not wrong, well, you will tell me this, Scrublands had a very strong connection to one of your non-fiction books, didn't it? The, your narrative non-fiction written on Murray Darling Basin, is that right? That's right. I travelled all through the Murray-Darling Basin at the height of the millennial drought, uh, writing a non-fiction book called The River. Mm. And that experience, I, I spent some time out in the Western Riverina, and that gave me the setting for Scrublands when I uh, then turned to um, then turned to write, try, trying to uh, have a go at writing crime fiction, yeah. This one, we'll go back to setting later because it's something that's very, very strong. For me, it affects me very strongly in your novels. But the setting for your new one, we'll concentrate on that, but we'll obviously be dipping in and out of your previous novels because there are little connections. But Treasure and Dirt is set where? It's set in a opal mining town. It's a fictional town called Finnegan's Gap. Uh, based loosely on the real opal mining town of Lightning Ridge and located not that far away from Lightning Ridge. So in the outback, many hundreds of kilometres inland, just under the Queensland border in New South Wales. And it's a pretty wild and uh, woolly place, mm. pretty much like the Wild West. Uh, and the story takes place in the middle of summer, so it is extremely hot. So we have in your first two novels, we had Martin Scarson, who was a, a journalist. And we had, as the novel progressed, we had um, Mandy, his girlfriend partner. Um, um, and they were, they became a sort of a, a pair for driving your, your, your story. We have a new pair in Treasure and Dirt. Now, have we finished? Have we finished entirely with Mandy and... Um, Martin, at this point, or are you just going to let them simmer? Um, look, I hope to come back to them at some stage. The reason I didn't continue on with them into a fourth book is because their own personal stories and their relationship and their own kind mm. of emotional mm. journey, if you like, is an important part of those first three sure. books. Mm. So I didn't think I could – I didn't really have an, a, a, a kind of emotional hook, a development in mind that I could use for a fourth book. And I felt if I just turned them into kind of objective, disinterested investigators, um, then that wouldn't work. Not because it would You'd be lose. somewhat cheating the readers. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having that kind of hands, um, you know, a disinterested sure. professional type mm -hmm. investigator. If, you know, you think Miss Marple, Poirot, whatever, mm -hmm. it worked very well. I just didn't think I could do it with them, and I didn't have a, a kind of emotional journey for them so that's when I thought no I'll, I'll swap them out I'll give them a bit of a break I think they deserve one <laughs> and then I went well I'll develop a different story I liked that the third of those books trust you're right Mandy is a kind of equal partner in the telling of the story she's a point of view character mm. and that's that worked well and I've continued that on with Treasure and Dirt with two new protagonists now tell us about those thought, two Okay, so I thought, look, I, I really like Martin and in some ways he was easy to write because he's a journalist and I was a journalist for 30 years. So I, I didn't have to go and research it. I knew how the world of journalism worked. My problem then, though, is if I came up with another journalist, it would be simply kind of Martin's Garth and Light. And yeah. it would be like, well, what's the point? 
So this time there are two uh, detectives, New mm-hmm. South Wales mm-hmm. police detectives. Mm-hmm. There's a reasonably senior detective, uh, Detective Sergeant Ivan Lukic. He's a homicide detective and he's teamed up in this opal mining town, Finnegan's Gap, with a newly minted young detective, Narelle or Nell Buchanan. She's not a homicide detective. She's a new detective based way out in the far west of the state at Burke, which is about as far west in New South Wales as you can go, essentially. And they're thrown together in this case. And what, and part of the story, like my previous books, there's multiple storylines. But there are storylines there that involve both of them because for both of them in different ways, their past records come back to haunt them. They're both being investigated, if you like, for malpractice, and that adds a certain element to the story. Do they trust each other? Do they support each other? Is it more advantageous to either of them to, if you like, throw the other one under the bus? Um, It also gives them a special incentive to solve the case or to solve the crimes that have been occurring in Finnegan's Gap because that's one way that they can salvage their reputations. Uh, Now, just one other thing, although Neil is an absolute brand new character, Ivan's actually a a very minor character in the first three books. Yeah, I think I remember him from Silver. Mm. Yeah, he's a rather surly Mm. offsider to the main police character in those first Mm. three books, a bloke called Detective Inspector. Uh, Morris Montefiore, and in fact, Montefiore is assigned to go to Finnegan's Gap, but at the last moment he can't make it for reasons that become clear mm. in the reading of the book. So I kind of like that idea that the, the books, although this is very much a standalone, you don't have to have read the first three books, but there are a couple of continuing characters, and indeed Martin Scarston gets a bit of a mention mm-hmm. in passing as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. so for those in the know, you'll spot them. So in this one, you've got, I mean, what have you not got? You've got opals, you've got, you know, opal thieves or ratters, as you call them. You've got a couple of sort of vying billionaires. You've got a crucifixion and you've got a cult. Yeah, that's the start. <laughs> that's the start. So how, just for people who haven't read it yet, how, what would you, just give us a quick, like a really, really short, plot recap of where this all takes off. Okay, I'll, I'll give you the setup. We're in this opal mining town, Finnegan's Gap, with a team of ratters. Now, ratters are a real thing, as I discovered when I travelled up to Lightning Ridge. Ratters are opal thieves, and they're the kind of lowest of the low because they go down and steal opals from their mates' mines. They're all in a very small town, right? So we're with this team of rather desperate men, these ratters. They go down this mine to steal opals. They've got wind that this miner, Jonas McGee, has found a really rich seam of opals. Mm. Uh, And they go down his mine, but instead of finding opals, they find him. He's been murdered. He's not only been murdered, but he's been crucified. And so they get the hell out of there as quickly as they can. But they've got enough, you know, decency in them, residual decency, to ring up the police and leave an anonymous tip, hey, this guy's murdered down his mine. Mm. And then the story, proper if you like, begins with um, Ivan arriving from Sydney and meeting Nell, who's driven across from Burke, and they start investigating. But as they investigate, these other plot lines start and other suggestions of criminality and characters appear. So you're right, you have these billionaire miners with a rivalry that's gone back decades, you have a religious cult, mm. you have eccentric uh, um, opal miners, mm. but you also have, then as the story goes along, there are other crimes, not just the murder of the opal mm. miner. There's a death of a young man connected to the religious sect who'd died some seven years before, and there's another possible crime that's happened decades before. And so you've got and you've got this issue with both Nell and um, Ivan's past. Hmm. So it sounds kind of complicated Ooh. in a way it is. But they're all interwoven and by hmm. the end, of course, it's all resolved. You know exactly what's happened when. So 
I mean, as you say, it is all kind of complicated. I mean, it's kind of hairy at places. There's so much going on. How do you, as a writer, I mean, it's like wild horses. How do you keep control of all of this? I mean, do you, you know, I think I've heard you famously say that you're actually not a mega plotter. How can you not be a plotter when you have this amount going on? Well, you. it evolves as I'm writing. Because if I try and plot, which does sound to me like, eminently sensible and a lot more efficient. Mm. The trouble is then I go and write it and I get a better idea. And seriously, with, with some of these storylines, I don't really know who's uh, killed, say, killed this miner. And then I'm writing it and I have this idea and I, I'm going out to that person. I'm working towards that conclusion yeah. and then I get a better idea. And so the ultimate answer to your question is I rewrite a lot. So as I'm writing, I get better ideas, I throw things out. So it's this evolving storyline. But mm. it makes it very interesting to so me as well. I'd as say writer. as a writer, that so must I'm, be fabulous. It's not, mm. it's not like I'm taking dictation of a set story. It's all, mm. almost at times as if I'm reading a story. And uh, I know this sounds a bit loony, but there yeah. are days when yeah. I can't wait to start writing because I want to know what happens next. <laughs> that sounds only hilarious. Yeah, this far from the idea yeah. of slog. Um, how about your your characters as well? Do you find then using this technique that you might have a character that you've put in, let's say, for a plot device reason or for because you need someone to be in that role and that they suddenly start emerging as something a hell of, well, hell of excuse my French, but you know, a lot more important? Does that happen? That your yeah, whole character really blossoms? Absolutely. That, that's happened several times. So um, you're right. Say your protagonists, the people who are taking you mm. through the narrative, in this case, Ivan or Mel, they need to learn something. You know, they need mm. to get a clue that's going to lead them closer to the, you know, solve the whodunit thing. Mm. So they, they could find something or they could meet someone who tells them mm. something. So you have this character, starts as a plot point. They meet them and you mm. think, well, I want to make this character interesting. Mm. So I might make them menacing or I might make them amusing or something like that. And so they become like a little little cameo. But there are occasions when they kind of just grow. Mm. And so in my first book, Scrublands, there's an old guy out in the bush called Colger Harris who's just meant to be an amusing kind of interlude mm. but he just grew so much he ends up having a much more important role in the story in this book treasure and dirt much to my own surprise in some ways one of the ratters that's just in the prologue which i just thought that was a prologue that's a setup these are just the guys who sort of set the clock ticking if you mm. like he's, he's set everything in motion by finding the body but one of them ends up coming back and playing a more significant role in the story. So you're absolutely right. Sometimes they start as minor characters mm. and, and they involve. So Ivan Lukic himself was just like a paragraph or two in Scrublands and now he's, you know, three or four books later, he's the main protagonist. Yeah, he's a, he's a good one with his little foibles. I, I loved the dynamic between Nell and Ivan and Michant say any more about that for the moment but I do hope there will be more to come from that little relationship I think there will be oh, I think I... there will be because again although I started with it very much with the intention of doing a standalone and then maybe just returning mm. to Martin or Mandy or moving on to something else by the time I'd finished mm. Treasure and Dirt their characters had grown enough and become mm. so rounded and evolved mm. that mm. I felt that they've got more to their stories to tell. Yeah, there's great tension that's usable. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that's interesting is that for you, place, or when you read all of your books, place um, is almost as strong as, as, it's almost a character in its own right. So in Scrublands, you're up in, in on the, on the Riverina, you've got, a, you've got silver, it's set, I mean, they're very different way down on the, on the coast. It's very, um, seaside resorty sort of place trust is a version of is kind of a contained version of sydney 
isn't it? Or yeah, it's, yeah. It's, set, it's it's set in Sydney, but it's quite a um, a small area of Sydney. It's not it's not it's not tourist Sydney. It's not the harbour or Bondi Beach or the Opera no. House. It's no. it's set more around for people who know Sydney, more around Surrey Hills, which is that area around the old inner city. It's around the central mm. railway station. And you like to kind of have these smaller little communities for for the reasons of your 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 plot, I presume, that it's easier to contain your yeah. characters in there. That's a, that's tell me about cults. You you've put cults into your um your to into two of your because you did have one in silver, did you not? Is there is there something? How did you research those? So they um that's true, although they're quite different. different. Mm. As a journalist, I did do stories every now and then concerning cults. I did one in New Zealand um, on one that's called The Exclusive Brethren, which is kind of like a hardline separatist outshoot of the um, of the, uh, uh, the Pilgrim Brethren in the United States. Mm. Um, quite serious. But I also did one in... Uh, a more amusing one, a cult-type church in Tennessee mm. based around Nashville, which is also tied up in a weight loss empire <laughs> called Slim for Him. And the message there was fat people don't get into heaven. So <laughs> that was it was kind of sinister, oh but it was God. also really weird and funny. Very crazy. So I, I think, I don't know, it just it lends itself to, to a, a good story. Um, mm. But I may have. I think I'm after two goes round. That might be it for cults with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to know because one might begin to wonder. Um, the um, next question, because I, I wanted to go for, um, as you say, I mean, you picked up stories in your journalistic career, which has been long and very varied. You've been around the world a bit and done a lot of reporting on different things. Your um, what would you say or what would be one of the biggest um, experiences or the biggest lessons you've learned from journalism that you can bring to your writing craft now as a fiction writer? I think there's many advantages in having been a journalist and there are some big disadvantages. Mm -hmm. But one of the great advantages I think journalists have is the writing process is totally demystified. You know you can't wait around for inspiration. So no journalist can ring up their editor and say, I don't think I'll file a story today. I, I'm, I don't, I'm not feeling inspired. The muse I mean, has very, not struck. Mm. That's a very quick mm. way of getting sacked, right? Yeah. Um, and I did learn on some of those times when I wasn't, you know, I was overseas, I, I had no option to down tools, but so I'd get ill or whatever. Mm. Um, and I had to force myself to write. Uh, and to work and sometimes those were the days where you produce your best material oh, I'm not sure why maybe it's because you had to focus and concentrate so much mm. um, so I think that's one of the aspects from journalism the other thing I think that I, I think I always had a hankering to write fiction but I didn't yeah. have the confidence to do it but after years of being journalist I then went and wrote those two non-fiction books they were kind of like travel writing, mm. so as you as you describe it, narrative nonfiction. So you can be quite impressionistic. Mm. It's just not a recitation of, of facts. Yeah. And I, I learned from that that I could write a book, you know, a passable kind of book. And the other thing I, I learned from that is that I really enjoyed the process. Yeah. So I think a lot of people like the idea of writing a book but find the actual effort of doing it rather difficult, a bit of a slog. So I found, almost to my own surprise, that I actually liked, one, I could do it, and two, I liked doing it. Yeah. And so that came out of journalism, and then from that came, you know, the idea of writing some fiction. Yeah, like you developed your writer's muscle, and then you were you, yeah. you were just ready to go. And it gave me a, an appreciation of the power and precision of words, too, yeah. and how important that is. So what you say that there were obviously down, you know, sort of negatives coming from journalism. What would you, you know, what, what would come to mind? Uh, a very important part in any kind of fiction is the voice sure. that the story is told in. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in journalism, you get stuck in a particular type of voice, which is you're trying to be neutral mm. and you're trying to be authoritative. Um, you're not trying to be emotional. Mm. It's a bit one speed. And also you tend to use a lot of cliches, a lot of shorthand, sure. which in journalism is actually a good thing. Mm. Just in a couple of words, people know what you saying yeah. the prime minister mm. has backflipped you know yeah. there's a rebellion on the back bench mm. you know it's it's shorthand it's cliche mm. it's very effective but you can't use it in anything no. any kind of literature at all because it's just very hackneyed and cliche mm. so you have to break you have to find a new voice and you have to be and and there are a lot of former journalists have become very fine writers, mm. whether they're literary or contemporary. I mean, a lot of uh, crime writers, successful crime writers are former journalists, but they're the ones who have been able to discover this new voice and have been able to break the shackles of that kind of journalistic voice. Intriguing, isn't it? Yeah, the, the cliche is that which must be um, beaten out <laughs> of you. Again, you tackle in all of your in all of your crime novels, you tackle huge issues of sort of corruption, whether it be political, institutional, you've got violence, you've got um, an enormous number of moral, ethical, political issues. Compared to what you might be saying as a journalist, how do you, what does fiction allow you to do um, that maybe non-fiction might, might not. I mean, or, or is fiction a really good place to talk about those things or are we kidding ourselves? There you are. So that's a three-point question, I think. I, th I think fiction, you can get, you can address, you can get some truths that it's more difficult to do in uh, non-fiction. Uh, you can certainly resolve things in a crime book. I do think uh, crime fiction modern crime fiction tends to touch on issues that are, are of concern to the community. Now, I don't think it's a deliberate ploy by writers, and I'm certainly like this. Mm. I'm not trying to do this in a calculating way, and I'm not tr certainly not trying to do it in any sort of didactic way. Mm. But it's almost like tapping into the zeitgeist of what's concerning people at the moment. Mm. Mm. So, you know, a few decades ago, you would have had a lot of crime fiction written about serial killers because that was a, a new and frightening mm. aspect. Or if you're, if you're writing those sort of action thrillers, it would be, you know, Russia and the KGB. And then more recently, maybe it's mm. Islamic terrorism. And, and nowadays, it, it's like white supremacists. So, for example, there's quite a lot of books now, you know, post uh, Me Too coming out, uh, the, you know, stories told with the voice of the victim, for example, yes. yeah. or stories about domestic violence. So I think they've got a message. They're addressing issues that are of great importance mm. in a society. Mm. But it's not necessarily that the writer has gone out to deliver some sort of lecture. It's more like they're just keying in to what the concerns are, are out and about at the moment. And I think in some ways crime fiction may be doing better overall in some of these aspects mm. and say literary fiction, which a lot of literary fiction is very concerned about people's internal lives, Identity. their own mm. development, yeah. and particularly their relations with other mm. people mm. and you know, the people who are close to them, family, whatever, uh, which have, yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant and mm. there's nothing wrong with that. And, of course, we want to read that. But it's almost like it's crime that's touching on some of these big issues. For, so, for example, you know, Michael Connolly, the, the great American no. crime writer, some of his books, just, they touch very lightly, but it's on the inequalities mm. in wealth and opportunity in America. Mm. And his Bosch guy has got this um, motto, it's something like, if, if, if there's not justice for all, there's not there's not justice for anyone. It's it's, it's something along yeah. those lines, mm -hmm. and so you can see he's not he's not out to lecture the the reader, and the reader may not even pick up on this at all. But he is touching on that nerve, that concern it's, in America yeah. that mm -hmm. you know not everyone gets an even break. No, no, um, and I mean one of the interesting things is that Australian particular crime fiction. Um, seems to be generating a lot of interest overseas, which is I find I find that not 
not at all surprising given the caliber of writing. Oh, goodness, we're not allowed. We're not allowed to talk as long as we want, I can tell you. But given the caliber of writing, I am not at all surprised. I, what do you think it is that translates so well about Australian, um, particularly this, well, I mean, it isn't a genre because there are so many types of crime writing, but yeah. what do you think is so appealing? Look, I think publishing is very fashion driven so sometimes you'll get a breakthrough book and then there'll be a lot of publishers jumping so in our mm. case i think jane harper's book the dry yeah was i think caught a lot of people by surprise in, mm. the, in the publishing industry both here in australia but then it did fantastically well in britain and in, in the us and elsewhere in translation mm. Mm. and publishers went oh this will sell so it's kind of like i think the same kind of thing might have happened with um so Scandi Noir, after those Stig Larsson books, yeah. The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, whatever, yeah. they were a success. And then yeah. suddenly it was like Scandi Noir was the flavour of the month. Yeah. So I think, I think though Australia has, particularly for readers, say, in Britain and, and to a certain extent in the US, there's a familiarity with Australia, mm. but there's also the things that are different and exotic mm. about it. So it, it's it's a bit of both, and I mm. think that, you know, like mm. to read a book like mine that's set in the middle mm. of a really hot summer, you know, Treasure and Dirt will come out in the UK in January. It's mm. called Opal Country over there, but it'll come out in January, mm. so it'll be freezing. So people <laughs> might go, oh, I, you know, I like the idea of a book that's got a bit of heat in it. <laughs> a bit of a holiday, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that will definitely um, get them all sort of, you know, on a, you know, bit of travel inside their mind at least. Chris, we have no time left. I just want to say, any recommendations for people? What have you read that you've really liked? And then we'll have to say goodbye. Anything I recent? just read a book. It's not out yet. It's called Dirt Town. It'll come out next year. It's a really good book. Dirt so Town. that's, a, that's a, right. a tip. And I'm reading Emma Biskic's book at the moment, oh, yes. her next Caleb Zellick yeah. one. So that's yeah. fantastic yeah. as well. All right. So, so there's, two, there's two. These two to, to look forward to. Look, Chris, it's it's far too short. I've had great fun. Thank you so much for, for, for talking to us. And, um, you know, we'll we'll be selling hand over fist, I'm hoping. All right. Thank you so much. And thank right. you, everyone, for listening. That's it, everyone. Thank you for listening. And you know what to do. Come in and see me and buy yourself a copy of Treasure and Dirt by Chris Hammer. Bye-bye.